Thank you this morning for uh, joining me. Uh, this is a great and interesting topic to me, and I want to hopefully convey this to you in some way. Um, the talk is broken down into three parts, so I'm going to give you a little table of contents here. Uh, I want to talk about the software patterns today, because I think we have a context that we approach patterns with, and it's important to start there. I want to shift over then to Alexander, Christopher Alexander, and you'll see who this guy is and, and sort of the inspiration of software patterns. I want to get into that and make a connection there. And then I want to move to Erlang. So I want to apply this scheme that I think is important to Erlang. And we'll see how that goes. Sound good? All right. So when you hear about software patterns today, most of you, I think, will think about this thing or something like this thing, software patterns. I uh, used this book when I built my first large software project, or ran and, 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 and led a software project. Used this book, I made sure that we implemented no less than 80% of the patterns. It was just like, this, this is the thing, this is all the smart people have gotten together and put patterns together, and we will learn and leverage this, and it will work out great. And the irony is it didn't work out great. The irony is that in all of my years, this is easily the worst piece of software I have ever written, without a doubt. And I'm sad, I'm sorry to say, I don't want to put the blame, but I blame this. I blame the software patterns. Um, as we'll see, software patterns actually, uh, patterns in general, the languages that we use to describe things, uh, re uh, cause the result. Uh, they are the seed from which our flower software springs. So depending on the language that you use will de determine what you build. If you have the wrong language, you'll build the wrong software. If you have the right language, you'll build the right software. I'm going to make that point. So the, soft, the, the, the current kind of goals of, of the software patterns movement today, this is a quote from Grady Bush in the, the, the forward of the, 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 uh, the book uh, on the pre previous slide. Uh, the goal is help developers leverage the expertise of other skilled architects. That's reasonable. We want to leverage, we want to get together and, and leverage our collective experience, skill. So um, skilled architects get together, they put things into a, a pattern manual, and we then get to use these and learn from them. They provide a recurring solution to common problems in software design. Also very reasonable, right? We've all heard this, this is good. And finally, speeds up the development process. So patterns have been sold to us as being a great thing because it makes us smarter, faster, stronger. We can jump higher, we can do more great things. And that's been the promise. And to, to some extent, that may be fulfilled. I think in my personal experience, it was not. But everyone has their different experience. So I wanted to say, for the record, I am not against the previous book. I'm not against it. I just have had you know, bad luck implementing it. I'm also not programming in object-oriented methodologies anymore. So consider that. Um, these patterns are often uh, associated with object-oriented programming. Um, so for me personally, this has been a not so great pattern experience. I recently started to read this book. This is The Timeless Way of Building by Christopher Alexander. And I started to read, this is the inspiration for the, the patterns uh, software movement. Um, you'll see it cited consistently as the origination of software patterns. This is where it comes from. And as I started to read this, I had a huge disconnect because I, I started to really enjoy what I was reading, uh, finding it uh, uh, enlightened, um, useful, uh, brilliant, and absolutely having nothing to do with the, the experience I had with patterns previously. Again, I'm being a, a little bit hard. Um, I am a bit jaded. I have some emotional issues about that project in particular. It didn't turn out very well from my point of view, so forgive me that. But when I approached this book, uh, I started to see patterns from his point of view, and I want to talk about that. So they're very different. So this is Alexander on patterns. First of all, he describes patterns as they apply to physical structures, so as high level as regions and towns, neighborhoods, uh, uh, houses, gardens, alcoves, uh, talks about towns, buildings, and construction. So this is his domain. So he's not talking about software, talking about these things. For Alexander, he's seeking this thing which is called the quality without a name. And it's, the book starts out a bit mystical. It kind of like, you know, it's like he's got these sort of you know, very terse and and you know, theoretical statements about quality and, and things that are hard to grasp. And he spends a lot of time trying to build up this concept of a quality without a name. I think he succeeds. I think in, in the end, you, you get a very specific impression of what he's talking about. But as I started to read it initially, I thought, this is kind of flaky. But as I saw what he was doing and what he was talking about, it became, for me, utterly brilliant. And I think we have a, a, a tremendous amount that we can take from this if we apply it correctly. 
So one of the things that's part, uh, sort of endemic to his model of patterns is that they're, they're discovered. They're not prescribed. I think when we look at patterns from the software uh, industry, many of them are sort of observed, but many of them are also prescribed. I think they, they, they feel to me as if they come from a whiteboard or some sort of, I don't want to say ivory tower, but an ivory tower, some sort of academic exercise of how things should be architected. Uh, they don't feel normal to me. They feel strange. I could go through some of the patterns um, and read them and read some of their descriptions, and you're free to do that, uh, and judge for yourself. I find a lot of them to be utterly, utterly confusing and bizarre. So not something discovered, uh, but very much prescribed. So he's talking about discovering patterns, and this is, a, this is the other sort of tenet that he brings forth, and I'm going to talk about this in, in detail, is that they are informed by human emotion. And this is a surprise. This was a surprise to me, and I think you might be surprised to, to see how effective this observation is when applied to software. Okay, so this is his point of view here. Now, he was asked to write a foreword, Christopher Alexander, of a patterns book. And so here's this um, sort of inspirational figure within the software patterns movement. Please read this book and write a foreword for us. And this was one of the quotes from that foreword. He says, but speaking only about what appears in this book, Patterns of Software, I must confess to a slight reluctant skepticism. I have not yet seen evidence of this improvement in an actual program. Taking this out of context a little bit, uh, he's not actually being critical here. He's actually talking about his own sort of lack of knowledge of software in general. So it's hard for him as an architect or a builder to come and weigh in on this software patterns industry when he doesn't know anything about software. But he tries, and he looks at this, and he says, can this be applied? Can my sort of Alexandrian model of, of patterns be applied to software? And he's skeptical. He's scratching his head saying, I don't know if it's even possible to apply this. And he says, you know, is it possible for a, a, a program to have sort of this quality that you might experience when you, you nestle up to a, with a book and a, and a crackling fire? Because this is the, this is the sort of thing, these are the sort of aesthetic qualities that he talks about, that he wants to create in building structures. And he's like, how does this work in software? How do you get the sensation of a, of a warm hearth, right, and, and, and reading a, you know, from a mahogany library in a leather chair? Um, is this possible? I'm a programmer. Your programmers. We've all nestled up to that program that feels like a crackling fire, pretty much. We, we've all been really turned on and excited by something. It's felt right. It's felt normal. It felt natural. A, co a, a library, a function, uh, a, uh, a piece of software, you can probably name a handful of them that you really, really like and you've experienced them, and that's an emotional affinity. I believe that we can take his sort of disposition, his, his approach to patterns, and apply them pretty directly to software, and in, in, in particular Erlang. So this is what I'm going to do. Before I do this, I want to really hammer on this topic of emotions, though. So this is a quote again from Christopher Alexander from this uh, uh, timeless way of building. To find good patterns, we must rely on feelings more than intellect. And that, I think, is the biggest surprise for me. I think it's the biggest surprise, it's the biggest disconnect from what we've experienced in traditional patterns and what he talks about. So let me give you an example here. Um, when I uh, have a, a dilemma uh, between choosing between two options, option A and option B, let's say it's a cookie and a cupcake. I had this happen recently. I want, I want both, but I can only have one, but they're both great, what do I want? I don't know. What I'll do, I, do, I literally do this, I'll take a coin out and I'll flip it. Heads, it's the cu uh, cookie. Tails, it's the cupcake. The coin decides. And then I observe. And at that moment, I am sensitive to my own emotional state. What is my emotional response at that moment? In most cases, I'm actually not neutral. I have a very subtle disposition one way or the other. And I note my, so I'm either sort of happy with the result. Oh, the cookie, great. Thank you, coin. Or I'm disappointed with the result. Oh, I really wanted that cookie. That tells me what I want, and then I get what I want. I ignore the coin, but I use the coin. <laughs> I use the coin to tease out an emotional response. And this is what he's talking about. Patterns made from thought without feeling lack empirical reality entirely. And he spends a lot of time on this, and he explains that it's not about opinions or theory or ideas or tastes. It's about visceral feeling. It's a sense. And for him, this is a matter of empiricism. Because we can always sit around and debate a point of view. We can debate an opinion, you know, whether some, hey, 
whether something is good or bad or, or, or right or wrong, but we, can't debate, we cannot debate our reaction. When you flip that coin and you observe your reaction, that is something that you can't help. It happens. And so he wants to seek out patterns that are feeling motivated. So when you experience something that's good, you note that. And you use that as a signal to tease out something of substance within that context. That's going to leak into our, our Erlang stuff. I know it's a little philosophical here, but you'll see this is kind of cool. OK. One last point about Alexander, and then I'm going to move, move on to, some, to some, uh, some of the Erlang stuff. This is a, a comment about architects and builders. So patterns do not come only from the work of architects and planners. He goes on to say, they come from the work of thousands of different people. So one of the, I think, underlying threads, uh, pre premises of his, of his work, is that every individual has a pattern language. Everyone has their own, his or her own experience, and things that we do repetitively. So he talks about building, buildings, we talk about code. Every person in this room has patterns that you use. Um, you may have sort of official patterns that are recognized, that are supported by language features and libraries, or they may be personal patterns, thing isms that you do, that you bring in. And you do them a lot. And I bet you do them because you like them. There's something about them that is good that brings a quality to your work that you enjoy, that has this sort of, what Alexander says, quality without a name. So the fact of the matter is, everyone in this room, every programmer, can participate in the elaboration of patterns. And what his work is about is formally doing that. It is about de defining a, a process and a method of identifying and naming patterns so that we can share them. But they're very personal. We share them, but they're personal. And patterns that are good collectively tend to surface. And you'll see this in towns. You'll see this in cultures, in building cultures. You'll see predominating patterns of building, architectural styles, um, different isms associated. And they came from regions. They came from individuals. They came from communities. They came from the soil. And this is his observation. The patterns are actually a, an evolutionary process, and they come up. More philosophy. I really like this philosophy, though. My, I have lately been uh, investing time and energy in understanding how nature inv invents and creates things. How the heck does photosynthesis come about? That's a really, really important invention and a great invention. How did that happen? I'd like to understand the processes there. It's very much an organic, evolutionary, natural model that Alexander proposes, and this is why I like it. That's why I'm attracted to it. All right, does that make sense as, a, as sort of a foundation? I just thought I was going like, to go through code and like, you know, here's, my, you know, here's how you generate a skeleton with this and here's how this interacts and with UML diagrams. And were you expecting that? Are you disappointed that I'm not, I'm not giving you UML diagrams? Nobody's disappointed. Is there any single person here disappointed? Oh, come on, Zach. You're trolling. You're trolling as usual. Yeah, we're not going to do UML today. What I want to do is... I want to develop a useful pattern language for Erlang. I'm not suggesting this doesn't exist. I'm not suggesting that the work in patterns in Erlang has not been good. I'm specifically interested in uh, working within the spirit of this model, of Alexander's model. And I've, I've taken all of you know, 12 minutes to introduce it. Uh, you can't possibly do it justice. But I want to give you a feeling for where I'm coming from. I'm jaded. I have a, I have a bad emotional response, historically, to the traditional methods that we use in, in building patterns for software. I don't like it. I want to stay as far away from that as possible. But what I see Alexander actually talking about, if we're going to take actual inspiration from him, I like that. So I think we can do some interesting things in the area of Erlang. I want to see this be a community effort with a completely free and open participation. This cannot be the gang of four. We just can't do that. That's ridiculous. It's great for marketing. Um, it's great to sell books, uh, and there's a lot of great content in that, uh, but uh, this needs to be, in my opinion, something that is completely community-oriented and open and free for everybody to participate in with complete democracy. That shouldn't be too controversial within the airline community. Okay, methodology. 
So let's talk about a pattern. This is lifted from his book, so I'm not going to reinvent anything. I'm not going to, my approach here is to not weigh in with any expertise here because I absolutely don't, have no idea what I'm talking about. I have no, no experience. I'm reading what uh, he's writing, uh, and, and it's very detailed. It's very, very well written. Um, you should get a, get a copy, go to the library, check out a copy, buy one, borrow one, read it. It's a great read, The Timeless Way of Building, um, just for personal edification. But uh, I really am not an expert here. So what I'm doing is simply stealing from him and, do, and just putting it down, right? Simple. So he wants us to first give a pattern a name. And it's really interesting. He has, uh, in, in this book, goes through uh, the same process that we go through when we name something. Uh, at least I do. When I try to name something, naming is extremely important to me. I, I'm somewhat obsessive, admittedly, probably dysfunctionally obsessive about naming things. I want these things to be completely obviously clear at a glance. And that is an extremely difficult process uh, to get that right, to get names immediately obvious, sort of naturally obvious and intuitive. But he has the same point of view, and, and he uses the same thing. He says, sometimes we don't know what to name something. So we give it a fake name, or we give it an interim name. We say, it has to do with this thing over here. And as we start to understand what this thing is, we get more and more specific. So, these names are very important. And I'm going to show you some examples of patterns that have names that are just me pulling stuff out of the air. I don't know if they're good. I don't know if they're not. We need to participate, I think, together to figure out how to name these things once we've identified that thing that we want to name. And that's hard work. But they need a name. They need a description as to why it's good. So this is the dividing line for me. I don't want a pattern language just to model something. I don't want to see it just, you know, here's some mechanical pieces, I'm going to describe that, and now I'm going to let you use that as a vocabulary. I want goodness. I want a sense that we're building great software. And I think that with the right language, we can build great software more naturally, more intuitively, more fluidly, uh, and, and, and more consistently. So I want it to be good. That's a standard. We don't want bad. Shouldn't be controversial, but unfortunately, I think a lot of these things are, uh, are, are, are glossed over because we're very technical. We're very sort of uh, model-focused and, 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 and sort of almost machine-focused and a little bit too theoretical. Alexander will ground us to our, our personal experience. He doesn't let us get theoretical. We can't get up here. We have to experience the things viscerally from a, from a human emotions point of view. Finally, we describe where it should be used. So we have a pattern. We describe why it's good. You might think of it, the why it's good as the benefit. So we put things in terms of how it benefits people or benefits you as a programmer. And then we clarify how this would be used in practice. Very, very simple. OK, here are the acceptance criteria. So this is me now. I'm, this is obviously, this is not Alexander. Uh, this is me sort of stumbling through this and thinking this might be a good idea. I think that these are good ideas. I think, first of all, you should be, the thing that you're naming should be used someplace, something that you can point to. So we're not like constructing abstract, abstract isms. Uh, we, see it, we see it working. And so we can draw it out from experience. Also, we should see it repeat, repeated over enough time so it can for, inform our experience. Again, trying to plug into something, trying to inhabit it. It's hard to inhabit something in a whiteboard. Very hard to do. People do it. They think that a whiteboard pictures are right. They are often not. They are almost always not right. You need to put something out there and run it and inhabit it and see it and observe it. So how was it to write? How was it to deploy? How was it to run? How was it to maintain? And you feel this. You, you know the difference between something that feels, you know, uh, this was a great experience. We had a bug in the system. We were able to identify it efficiently and fix it. And it was minimal downtime. That feels great. Have you ever encountered a situation where you put something into production and it takes three weeks to debug it because you can't replicate it and you have no tracing fe features in, in the system? You have to constantly redeploy debug versions of your code. That feels bad. That, that, that every human being on Earth will say, bad. That's bad. We don't like that. So something that should recur repeatedly and over enough time to inform experience. And finally, yes, it must feel good. So again, human emotion. All right? It's a little bit different. It's a little bit different. But I think what we're, you'll see, I'm going to get to, to some examples here. I think what you'll see is that this is actually not as crazy as it sounds. off. Smart. OK. So what, I'm, what I want to do is um, Alexander breaks his patterns down. I shouldn't say breaks it. He, he generally categorizes them. But they apply to things that are very, very big, like regions, 
towns, neighborhoods, all the way down to you know, how should this corner be developed. And, there, and, and, and the socioeconomic patterns, uh, patterns related to neighborhood and age, uh, different uh, types of individuals. Uh, there's lots of different types of patterns that he uses. And I think the same general approach can apply here, has to apply here. Um, I'm going to break down a number of, pa of categories for the patterns, and we're going to put the patterns in the category and just kind of help to, to, to block these out to say, you know, th these are different types. So here, here's the most fundamental type of pattern is the Erlang OTP construct. So here I'm talking about the language. So a function, a module, uh, a, an OTP application, a supervisor. These are the things that you'll see in books. These are patterns. Uh, you can point to them. You can see them. You can run with them. You experience in them. You experience them. If you're new to Erlang, they are novel supervisors. Right? That's an OTP behavior. Anybody who's built an OTP compliant application has worked with supervisors. You have to. So that's not that interesting. That's not like this esoteric pattern. But it is absolutely a pattern in this language that we should name, describe it, why it's good, and where it can be used. And you'll see examples of that. Another category that I think is important is the function type. A couple of years ago, I gave a, a presentation here uh, on writing beautiful uh, code in, in Erlang. And in that, we're, I broke down a number of different function types that I've personally seen. So I'm not trying to you know, uh, present an absolute list here, but the things that I, I generally run into. So accumulators, initializers, uh, message handlers, different types of functions. And you can see it in your own code. You'll see certain types emerging. I want to name those types. I want to understand why they're good, why they provide value, put a name to them so that we can start to use them in a shared pattern language. So we'll see some examples of those. Similarly, process and behavior types. So behavior, of course, is a callback module, but it really is defining a type of, of, of behavior associated with a process. So it's, it's taking a process and then layering a set of functions on top of that, and that gives it a type. Um, it's sort of the closest thing to, you know, to, to, to I don't know, it doesn't apply to object-oriented. It's, it's a behavior. Um, but there are types that we use, um, and these, are, these kind of drift up into business logic and other constructs or facilities that are interesting. So I want to name those, and again, I'll show you some examples. Above that, I see application-level facilities, and some, there's some overlap here. But an application-level facility would be something that provides a facility to your application. Um, broker, you know, a broker, a, a, a you know, pub-sub service of sorts, pub-sub facility or a data service, uh, a facility. Um, there are patterns that occur repeatedly. There are really good patterns that we're not naming that we should name. And when we name them, we can go pluck them out and use them and talk about them when we're talking about how to solve a problem, how to build something. I don't, uh, distributed facility, I don't use uh, distributed Erlang. Uh, I'll, if I have a distributed application, I'll just use uh, network or, or socket libraries. Uh, those of you who do use distributed Erlang and build distributed applications using this will have patterns, and I don't know what they are. Um, I would be very interested to learn, uh, but this is part of the Erlang ecosystem, and we need to be able to talk about distributed patterns, distributed facility patterns. And then finally, I have here principles. Um, this is a bit fuzzy. It's a little bit difficult to point to that. I'm not saying you've got to point to something and see it working. Um, these principles are hard to do that. I don't know if this is the right name. It might be coding conventions could be in there. Uh, but I think principles is, is close to what I'm talking about. And there are certainly some other scopes here, or type categories here that I'm missing. I don't want to be overly controlling here, but I want to give us a framework to try to think about how to, you know, just think about this. So we're going to observe things. Well, where does this belong in this panoply? Where is it, you know, where do I put this thing? And I think this is helpful in that respect to me anyway. Okay, finally, some examples. Before I get into the examples, any, uh, does this make any sense? This is it completely bizarre? I got one nod and one thumbs up. All right, that represents about 2% of the room, and that's, that's a good start. I got two, okay, some more. Okay, good. I think we're on out of 3%. All right, well, let's try to get to five, and I'll stop there. Okay. Here's some examples, and I, I hope that these will bring some something concrete to at least the stuff I'm talking about. So this is a pattern that hopefully everyone under, uh, knows. Um, and if you don't, you should get familiar with this. In terms of the sheer joy of using Erlang, this is most certainly within the top two. <laughs> this is a revolutionary pattern. Um, and it feels to me awesome. 
Uh, this fits into the Erlang OTP scope. Uh, it is a process, a supervisor, is a process dedicated to starting, supervising, and restarting processes. That's what these things do. Um, maybe it seems kind of subtle, but here's what it does. This is why it's good. It helps you recover from cro process crashes. There should be nothing, nothing like, more emotional than crash, right? I mean, this is an emotional thing. Um, if you crash, that's generally a very strong negative re emotional response, but if you can recover from a crash, that is a thing of beauty. And uh, most languages labor to get your code right. Erlang, I believe, almost taunts you to get it wrong. You almost want to put, no, you do want to put bugs into production. I, I just want to see this work. It's just fun to see this work. You, you've got, oh, there's a, there's a bug. Uh, yes, it's crashing, it's restarting, and it's filling up logs, but you know what? Nobody notices. Supervisors are intrinsic to this, and they spawn goodness throughout the land. So they are a very good, they're a very good pattern that we should, we should know about. We want to use these wherever we need fault tolerance. If you don't care about fault tolerance, don't worry about it. Okay, so that's, that's our start pattern. That's, that should be not that controversial. Uh, this is a, uh, the next pattern is a, is a function type, and I have uh, just a few examples here. Let me make a point on that. Um, I have like seven examples, six examples. There are probably, conservatively, a hundred plus patterns that we could easily get to, e easily. Um, this is just a taste. This is just, in fact, this is just a, a you know, a, a scratch on, on this journey. I will propose an outline uh, what I, where I think this needs to go. It is not the work of an individual or a group. You'll see that. So these are just examples, and, uh, and only a few. But it gives you an idea of what I'm thinking about in terms of a methodology and, 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 and how these things would materialize and be presented. Okay, so a function is, uh, a message handler is a function that is called to handle a, receive, a received message. Um, this is like if you, know, you write, write a gen server, it's hello info, hello cast, hello, these are, hello. I say hello. <laughs> handle. I write a lot of hello world apps. Every app, every app should be a hello world app. Um, handle. Handle info, handle cast, these, these are message handlers. Um, if I'm ever handling a message, it's always handle under something. It's just a convention I use. And then I know that's a message handler. So what's good about these is it simplifies handling a message as details are handled by a dispatcher. Now, I think this is a little awkward here. I have found that trying to put like, the, the essence of something into, into words to share is unbelievably hard for me. I just, I think this is, is close to kind of what I'm thinking about, but I think this, you could probably take a few passes. Here's what I mean. Um, if you look at what's going on with these message handlers in Gen Server, there's a lot of stuff that goes on before the dispatch and after, and that stuff is valuable. If you were to do that yourself, you'd have a lot of code above your handler and the actual handle block or receive block and after, and it would clutter your code and it would make it hard to read and it would make it buggy. So the goodness here is that the, all of the complexity of the, the, the pre and post dispatch uh, functionality is implemented here. Now, how do you put that in a sentence this big? We try. Uh, it doesn't have to be that big. But if to share this thing, it's important, I think, to get to the es essential goodness of something, what makes something good, quickly. And to do that, you need a good name, and you need a short description, and you need to be able to get to the point, the value proposition, very, very quickly. So that's, that's what I'm trying to do here. I don't think it's perfect, uh, but I'm, uh, this, is, this is the effort. So this, is, this pattern is um, something that I've observed and in the, the library E2 um, that, 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 that I wrote, this is one of the two primary process types. Um, and in my observation, uh, a, a, this is the uh, process behavior uh, scope, uh, and the description here is a process that is expected to stop after pre performing some task. So in Erlang, to do this uh, under supervision, people typically would use a gen server and use a trick in the init, which returns a zero for, for the timeout, which calls handle info with timeout. And it's a way to get out of init into your process running very quickly, and then you can perform your, your task operation. That's extremely awkward and difficult. So there should be a construct within Erlang that lets you just run something very quickly. And Proclib doesn't really, it lets you do that, but you lose a lot of other functionality. I'm getting very technical here, but conceptually a task is something that you start and it, it's supposed to finish. Now, Elixir has this as a first-class citizen. Uh, I think E2 pre predates that. I believe he might have taken inspiration from that. If not, that's fine. Um, this is a convergent evolution. It's not that complicated. Um, systems can be broken down into 
uh, long-running operating systems, daemons, and, and tasks. And I found that when I build software in, in Erlang, I'm always thinking about, is it a task or is it a service? Is, it, is this process something that's long-running and hosting some functionality over time, or is it something that's performing some task? So this, to me, is a v personally, personally is a very important pattern that I use all the time, and I really like it. Uh, it's simple, and, and the goodness here is that handle short-lived work autonomously, so you need to do something, boom, task, and you use it, not surprisingly, when you need to uh, perform short-lived short work autonomously. So, again, it's hard. I don't know. It, it, some of this language is awkward, um, but it's a starting point. And people, what I think will be interesting is when people see at least the starting point of what's going on here to get feedback, and people hack it up and change it. And I'll propose a, a method uh, a contribution policy that was very, very, very open and aggressive in getting people to contribute to this. All right, just a few more tasks here, uh, or a few more patterns uh, as examples. Um, cleanup crew. Now, this is something I have not heard before, so I think this is, I think this is mine. I think this is a novelty here. Uh, a cleanup crew, and this goes into uh, application level facilities. So this is an example of kind of a higher level construct. Usually it's implemented as a process uh, or a behavior. But to me, this is a logical function of, of an application. So I'm describing that as an application level, function, uh, app, application level facility. Uh, cleanup crew is this. Uh, it's a process that cleans up after other processes. What I find it, it, developers often do, it's a little bit like error handling. You, you try to write something that cleans up after itself. For example, if you write a temporary file, uh, there's a temptation within the, pr within the function that uses that temporary file to clean that thing up after you're done. So you're a good citizen. So you go camping, it's a picnic, and you clean up after yourself, and everything is perfect. The problem is that you will always fail at that in some way. If the computer shuts down, for example, that temporary file will be, well, it gets cleaned up when it starts, but that's a, incidental. There's always something that will thwart that. So I found inexperience in putting these systems in production. This is what I would do. You can't get it perfect, so what do you do? Well, you've got to clean up. You've got to put something into, into motion that will fix what's broken in, that, in those few cases where, there's a, there's a, there's a, where that, that uh, fault occurred. So you have to do it in 0.001% of the time. Why not do it all the time? Why not change your whole approach and just say, I'm not going to ever, ever delete a temporary file if I create it. I'm not ever going to try to fix something. I'm going to leave my picnic site as completely messy as I want. I'm going to work on what I need to do. And then you appoint a cleanup crew to come by afterward. Uh, and you can run these things. You can pull them. You can do all sorts of interesting things. But I found that this is a remarkably good pattern for building robust systems. You find systems that just start to work magically. It's like, how did it know? Did, oh, that guy. He was advocating for this state. Cleanup crew went in and he said, I want the state to be right. And he just kept checking and checking and checking and made it right. So for me, I call this a cleanup crew. Maybe there's a better name. But now this is an example of the pattern that's starting to move up the chain here into, I think, some innovative ideas. Now, there's a lot of those out there. You have these ideas. Uh, they're in your code someplace. You might not even be aware of those things. There are things that you like. There are things that you put into production or, or, or run or experience that feel good. And what I would encourage you to do is note that try to put a name and differentiate what is going on here that is making me feel good about this. And I think you might have a useful pattern there. And then you can, you can contribute to this, this process. So why is it good? It removes the burden of cleanup from other processes. And you use this when you need to clean up tasks. To be, um, clean, clean, clean up tasks. Huh. When clean up tasks need to be performed. Some of these are kind of obvious once you understand the, what they do. OK, a principle, crash by default. Um, People, people uh, this is similar to uh, fail fast. I think fail fast for me is too general. Fail fast is not, uh, it doesn't capture what I want to capture here. What I'm talking about here is rather than trying to handle exceptions by default, don't handle them and allow the process to crash. So basically remove your error handling. So it isn't just fail fast, it's specific. And it comes from experiences of seeing in my own code and others, a, a, a tendency to try to fix errors. And if you, if, if you have exception handling in, in Erlang, uh, unless it's very precise and, and well understood, you probably should just remove it. And I think this is an important pattern, an important pr principle, at least to name and understand. Uh, it dramatically simplifies code. Uh, if you ever have a bunch of exception handling uh, logic in your code, just delete it and see what happens. Just try it. You'll, you'll, your uh, functions will be reduced probably to 20% of what they were, if not less. And you might just find yourself being happy because it works anyway. 
Um, Erlang is remarkable in that respect, and it gets back to that process isolation and supervisory goodness. Use it everywhere. Use it everywhere. This is an easy one. Okay. So those are some examples. Um, I, what I've done here, I'm going to flip over to this site and show you this. So this is live, and this is a hack. This is like me going as fast as possible to just get something started. I don't want to suggest that what I'm doing here has really any credence other than the goals, the methodology, the approach. I think, I think there's something good here. And, and what I'm very interested in here, I'll kind of walk you through this, is getting people to contribute to this and to contribute their own ideas and, and weigh in. Hey, I think this name could be better, or I'm not sure this is an actual pattern, or you know, this could be a tweaked over here, uh, or here's an illustration that helps to clarify these things. So what I have currently, this is a super simple site. This is all static. Oh, this is, uh, let me do this. This is all static. It's, uh, it's Lambda Pad, yay. Erlang's static con content generator. If you don't know about it, and you use this, you'll learn about Lambda Pad. So the source to this is, uh, it's, all, it's all plain text, all marked down in Erlang terms, which get compiled down into, into the website. But th these are the patterns I have. Uh, I did this before. We'll stop, take a breath, and then it doesn't happen. Okay. So here's what I have. Um, it's like 33 or so of these things. Um, I'll just name a, you know, kind of scan through acceptor pool, uh, accumulator is a function type, you know, when you're building a list, these types of things, a broker, um, behavior, cleanup crew, there we go, connection pool, uh, data service, dispatch, function, that's in the Erlang, that's an actual function, the Erlang OTP construct, get opt arguments, you know, the pattern where you say in a function call, rather than having like 15 arguments, you have maybe three that are essential and required, and then the rest are optional. That's a get opt pattern. Um, maybe you can name it something else if you don't know what get opt is, but to me, it's, that's, that's, get opt is a very, very good pattern, and, and when you apply it to Erlang functions, it helps to really clean up your APIs a, a great deal. I wish they were used more, but that's in there. IO list, really important pattern. Everybody should know about this and use it. It's goodness squared, uh, rate limiter, service, stats sync really quickly on that. That comes from Ulf Wieger's uh, GProc. Uh, tremendous uh, insight there in a project that was running. You can point to it, it was repeated, uh, and it's a great pattern. GProc lets you, from a process, poke data out into a, a collector, a, a, a stats sync, and, and then others can then see what the statistics of, 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 pro of the processes are. Very seldom used. GProc should be in the core. It's a very important pattern. Um, it's, it's identified here. So you can kind of see where, where I'm going with this. Um, that's erlingpatterns.org. There's a contribution policy there. It's all pull requests. It's super simple. If you give me a pull request, I'm just going to merge it. Um, I'm going to use Peter Hinchin's model for uh, merging pull requests, which is merge first, ask questions later. It is controversial. Um, I don't care. Uh, we're going to be as aggressive as possible at including everybody in every way. Um, don't be surprised if other people modify your, your contributions, but that's the way it works. It's going to be a free-for-all of contributions, and we'll see what happens there. Okay, so I've got a few uh, minutes for, for, uh, for questions here, but let me just quickly summarize. Um, what this is for me is just a starting point, and it's early days. I was up late just filling in some hack descriptions just so that I'd have them. Just a brain dump, stream of, stream of consciousness. The real work is the community. The real work is you uh, contributing to this. I really want to give Alexander's model a chance. I, I'm really going to keep an eye on, personally, I want to keep an eye on, is there something good here? I mean, what's the, what's the emotional component to this? Why does this feel good when you use it? And help I really want people to think about um, the, truly the emotional part. This is not an academic theoretical exercise. This is a matter of translating our joy of programming, uh, which is informed by all that we are. Uh, as human beings into things that, we, that surface and become patterns that we can talk about and share. And these are the patterns. When we start to formulate and internalize them, what we produce will be good. That's the theory. So I want to give this a chance and see what happens. It's very, very hard, I've found, and, and uh, I'm just interested to see what's going to happen here. So it's very experimental. So with that, I think I have a good 10 minutes here to get into some shouting matches with people. Who wants to shout? Uh, yes? The uh, template pattern, do you have any thoughts on like, when you should switch from a single function unit to how we should read Genomet? 
I, uh, I never, never use GenEvent. I think it's a bad pattern. <laughs> I don't think that Erlang uses GenEvent. Um, I think it's out there, but I don't think it's actually used. I think it's, it's stub for uh, the error handler, but I don't think it's used at the core. Last I checked, it wasn't used anywhere. Um, so I wouldn't use GenEvent under any, it, it causes problems with supervision. It's really tricky to, to, to use it in a way that's fault tolerant, I've found. Um, but, you know, if you, so here's what I would say. Let's, let's bring this back to the pattern exercise. Um, what have you seen that works well, and what have you seen that doesn't work well? And, and try to, in, you know, s collaborate with colleagues, uh, you know, find out what, your, in your experience, um, is a good thing, and then try to name that. So if you have a question about how to do something, I don't know if that fits into the patterns work here. I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, it's not obvious how that question, you know, elaborates but, or, or plugs into this. Um, but I would say, you know, if you're identifying a problem with something, let's say you see that in here and say, how does this work? You know, raise an issue within this project. It's all in GitHub, so we're going to use the issue, issue tracker in GitHub. Um, so people have issues or, qu or questions about something that they can, they can ask there. Yeah. Yeah. And the trade-offs, the pros and cons, is that you, you, just, you get into it, you, uh, there's these, the good things that are happening, and there's the bad things. So you might, you might decide that the handling of my functions and the event are both patterns, but they cover slightly different scopes, and so the pattern language is discussing when they're appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the, the comment was about um, these, these patterns having to have a context, and that's where sort of the where used part is uh, in, in this. And the where used examples here are one line, so really they need to be you know, fleshed out in a full set of documentation. Um, I really don't know. I, I don't know. Um, I, I think that, that uh, I, would, I, I think I didn't put Genevent out there because I personally don't like it. That's ridiculous. Somebody put it out there. Somebody go put Genevent out there right now. Do a pull request and I'll merge it right now. Um, so, and then we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, but, but I'd like to see that process emerging from this. Um, but what I do know is we should be able to name, whatever comes out of it, we should be able to put a name to it. And we should be able to use it effectively to build good software within the appropriate context and understand where the trade-offs would, would, would apply. Um, Alexander's book is big, and he covers a lot of this uh, in, in, in filling in the pieces that I can't possibly, A, I don't understand them fully, and B, I couldn't, under, I couldn't communicate them in this short period of time. So there, there's that. We'll use that as our, our Bible for this project. Yeah, in the back. Uh, do you think it makes sense to communicate those patterns in uh, actual, the actual implementation, like describe them using Erlang code? Yes. Or rather describing them in words? Because the problem is, if you describe it just in words, uh, using very high level statements, then it's very vague. Yeah. Uh, people pops up. It has like tons of different dimensions you could go in, go, go to. And you can't just go and write yeah, I agree with that. So, so in, in, in this uh, uh, hello world example of the project, I don't have any illustration. I don't have any sample code. Both are required, I think. Um, if you look at uh, a pattern language, which is the follow-up to uh, the timeless way of building, which actually contains like 258 patterns, it's an incredible scope. And it, and it represents unbelievable work, detailed work. There's all, almost always an illustration, a photograph, or something to help you understand spatially what's going on. In fact, I believe that's a rule for him. Um, he says, because he's dealing with spatial uh, problems, you must have a drawing, or you must be able to draw something with this. So I think we can apply that. Um, maybe not say we must have source code, but we must have something to elaborate visually so we're not just talking about a, a, a theoretical concept without something uh, tangible. We have to be able to put this into practice. So we have to have what you're describing, yeah, Dave. Yes, the Genevent thing made me realize that it, it might be helpful to have, in addition to the, the, some, some sort of stuff about maybe anti-pattern or you, you, you can do this, but unless you really... Yeah, you know, process dictionary. The process from. dictionary, and it's got a skull and crossbones next yeah, to it. Yeah, something like that. Or, you know, um, yeah, so you know, that's... Um, I think um, you know, it's interesting. The, the, I don't think it shows up in the pattern language, in the specific patterns uh, that Alexander's put together in the, the, a pattern language book. But he often talks about bad patterns uh, in contrasting uh, to contrast good patterns. So I don't know how this fits into the scheme offhand, but I think it's a good idea. I think it would be very. I mean, people say you know people here all the time don't use the process dictionary. I don't know. I've heard that so often. I'm actually tempted to go use it all over the place just to see what happens. I mean, is it really that bad? Um, I, I don't know, but it would be great to have an anti. Yeah, an anti pattern is a great idea. It's a great idea. One other quick thing: the book that you uh, referenced, Patterns of Software. If you Google that phrase, the first result that comes up is a PDF from the author Richard Gabriel, who is, in addition to being one of the creators of Common List and uh, PhD in math, is also got a degree in creative writing and is an excellent writer. It's worthwhile. 
this was the forward. That, this is where Christopher Alexander scratching his head going. Patterns of software, yeah, it's a good read. Any, any other questions? Yeah? How uh, do we want to indicate community acceptance for patterns? How do we want, oh, that's a good question. So I think, I think yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think that um, my, my immediate thought would be, it would be interesting to see a level of consensus or agreement on whether this is good. Maybe a voting, I don't know. Um, but, but I think I would say that because it is, we're, we really want to identify things that have a universal goodness or positive response. I don't think a single person in the room would, would argue that supervisors are bad, but they certainly might argue that Genevent is. I would make an argument. I don't think Genevent should be in this list, but there's probably a lot of people who do, and that's probably going to, you know, we're going to see some yeses and nos. I would say those should be designated as controversial in some way. So maybe this belongs over like in a Wiki, Wikipedia format at some point, a w w media wiki or something that can give us uh, upvotes and downvotes or something. I, I just wanted to get this going as quickly as possible, but I think that's absolutely right. We need to, to have some visibility into, as things evolve in this, where is the consensus on it and, and how are things coalescing on that front in, over time? Yeah. It could be. That, that, that's an idea. Uh, yeah. I think you should be able to. I think you should be able to buy patterns with beer. <laughs> like if you can, like you just do. Like there'll be a currency of some type. I don't mean. I mean always be, like beer has to always be a part of Erlang culture, but I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't. I, here, here's what I would say to that. Um, I don't think it's a problem we have right now. I think the problem we have would be just to get the first pull request. That's where I'd like to go, and just see where it goes. Um, I want to see a really hard, I want to see a problem emerge that's like, yeah, this is a problem. This is a pro I don't know. I, it could be. We want to have things linking to, to other things. I just don't know at this point. I'm, uh, yeah, we'll see. Even having up and down voting could be potentially useful because you can see something in that whole green or, or you know, high positive votes. It's like, oh, this must be good. It's all red. And, you know, then it's like, oh, this is bad. If you have a, a combination of both, yeah. 50 50, then it's like, okay, this maybe. Yeah, some, something like that. I think, steal it. I think that would be helpful. Any questions or comments? Anything else? No? Nope. Yes? Just uh, thinking it would be useful for at least some of these to be able to like, auto automatically detect these patterns within your projects. I mean, for some of them, it's just dead. So we could have like a certification process. <laughs> we could just say, you're, you're like 98%. We'll have like a logo. <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Simon Thompson about Ryan Moore. Yeah. I, I, Maybe, maybe, maybe. I, I, you know, I'm very, very happy to see where this goes. I mean, I literally mean I think the next problem is, is getting one other contributor. That's my problem right now. Um, and, and we'll see where that goes. Because that's really the life of a project, is, is people actively contributing. So I think we can hash these things out over time as, as, as things start to, to, co to, to develop. Yeah? Just have one, one suggestion. As someone else mentioned it too. Since you're setting the pattern of how these things are going to be organized, it would be probably good to have one of them fully fleshed out. Everybody knows. Yeah. So maybe the problem, yes. So that's actually the next problem. I have to go do some work. And I was really hoping that somebody would do a pull request and just make that happen. <laughs> but you're right. I should, I should probably go and flush some of these out, at least in one. Just one. Just one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but honestly, I, I think, actually, I think it would be great to just see. I, I think people should just pile on. I don't care. I mean, this is just, uh, this is totally experimental. There's zero ego here. Um, in fact, it's interesting, Alexander's premise is this is a completely egoless exercise. It's all empirical, it's all observation, and it's all feeling-based. It's wonderful. Okay, I have time for one more question. Yeah. Um, I heard Joe talk maybe five years ago about the idea of concurrency or no alternative. Yeah. It seems to me there should be some high-level patterns out there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So the comment was uh, um, the, the specific uh, term that Joe uses and others, uh, concurrency-oriented programming, um, that's an example that I don't know if that's a pattern or not. I mean, it, it may be. Uh, um, you know, how do you use it? How do you apply it? Um, is it a principle? It may be a general category. It's almost like saying object-oriented programming. But are there certain concrete uh, 
executable, deployable patterns within this model that elaborate, that, that, that fill this concept in specifically. So this could be a, a, a category or something. I don't know. I think so, absolutely. I don't, I, I don't have any rigid structure here. I hope that's come across. I just want to, get, I want to get people contributing to this. The only rigid structure I have is really I want to, I want to, I want to really give Alexander's uh, model a fair shake here. Yeah. For what you commented, you might want to look at some of Kevin Hammond's team's uh, scale project. They put it together a bunch of patterns and some libraries to do current stuff in parallel. Pull request. I don't know. I don't know. Weigh in. Contribute. So in your, in your ideal world, how would people help? What would they do? <laughs> so when I say pull request, yeah, um, well, I, I really just want to see some faces show up on this. Oh, this went to sleep. Yeah, I want it, so right here, this is it. I think this is my standard for my next, the, the, here. So we do a refresh here. I probably lost network. Well, project activity is really empty there. Actually, there is some project activity. There's, a, there's some sort of networking thing going on here. Uh, it's on, just go to, just go to uh, erlangpatterns.org and it's all, it's all linked there. Um, so I don't mean I don't mean to do I completely dodge your question. I d really don't know. Um, I think if you've got some thoughts, right, looking at the GitHub repo, I'm going, okay, well, what can I do? What do you do? Yeah. So I think I think I think um, I, I think there's yeah, a, a very terse read me there that would hopefully point you in the right direction. Um, if that is uh, uh, ridiculously hard to follow, uh, put an issue out. Uh, I want to get you involved. I don't want to, uh, I'm lazy, and I want to, I'm also very interested I'm to see what the community. I'm trying to even look up the ones you guys' examples on here and find them, and their terse are in here, and they'll tell us why. Yeah, go into patterns, go into the pattern subdirectory, you'll see the meta, you'll see the markdown files in there. Okay, so that's a good feedback. I can, I can go ahead and, and, uh, and help to make that clear. Um, but really, I want community here. Um,